Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As introduced, my name is Seung Bam Cha, and I will be talking about general toxicity test using rodent and non rodent species and the outline of the uh, ICH as for guideline. So for the general uh, toxicity study, before that, I'd like to define what toxicity test is. When it comes to the toxicity test, we uh, try to understand the side effect, including the toxicity on the animal, and the measurement is uh, made quantitatively and qualitatively. So. For the test articles, it can be uh, animals or fish or bacteria, whatever. So we can call it as a, a test article. And the, the test system and the test article can include pharmaceuticals, the cosmetics, health function of food, and others. And there are different types of toxicity testing, which include general toxicity, special toxicity, and other toxicity testing. For general toxicity, we have single dose and repeated dose. I will explain them today. And for special toxicity, uh, we have reproductive developmental toxicity, genity, carcinogenicity, tumor, tumorigenicity, and antigenicity and local toxicity testing. For other testing, uh, it includes toxicokinetics and biodistribution testing. For general toxicity test, we need, we need to design and implement the test, and we follow the guideline during that process. For general toxicity test, particularly for the uh, pharmaceuticals, you can see these different types of the guidelines, like from the MFDS, Standards of Toxicity Study for Pharmaceuticals, ICHM3, EMA guideline, and as for from the ICH and OECD. So, like how many uh, animals need to be used for different group. That details is specified in the MFDS and in the OECD. However, EMA and ICH guidelines are not providing such in-depth details. For example, for the, uh, the chronic toxicity testing, the ICH guideline does not provide the details, so you need to refer to the OECD TG452 chronic toxicity studies in deciding how many animals need to be included in one group. So for the general toxicity test, we have single dose and repeated dose. For single dose, it is often called as acute toxicity test. So test article is tested one time, and the toxicity from that uh, test um, article or the material is measured. If the dose is too much, then the guideline says that the single dose or the multiple dose given within 24 hours that is specified in the guideline. Usually, we uh, have like four hour or six hour intervals for the multiple doses in order to administer the certain amount that we intend to uh, administer. For repeated dose toxicity testing, we have subacute and subchronic. For the subacute, it's more about like two weeks or four weeks repeated dose, and subchronic toxicity test. Uh, 13 weeks. And for the chronic toxicity test, we have ICHS4 guideline. ICHS4 guideline deals with the duration of chronic toxicity testing in animals. So for rodent, it specifies a six months. And for non rodent, there has been discussion between like six to 12 months, but the agreement is nine months. And that is an important point in the ICHS4. The S4 itself, the text is not long, but now we have like six months and nine months uh, standard. So when you do the uh, chronic toxicity test for rodent, it's a six months. So 26 weeks uh, repeated dose uh, toxicity test is usually the design for the non-rodent uh, nine months, 36 week repeat uh, dose toxicity testing is the usual design. For the single dose toxicity test design, 
for the test items, clinical science, body weight, uh, necropsy findings. But at the same time, when necessary, if there are unusual findings from the necropsy, or we want to, if we want to you, uh, understand the histopathological examination, then we can do that too. For rodent, the A ALD is calculated. For like 10 years ago, from the MFDS guideline, we saw that the goal of the single dose toxicity test was to calculate LD50, not ALD, but the revision was made. So for the rodent, the calculation is done for ALD. And it considers the welfare of the animals. We need to reduce the number of the animal dying from the uh, testing. So the revision was made. For food, the MFDS guideline was established for the, like the toxicity on food, like the health function of food. It's not like single dose of toxicity testing from OECD guideline. The minimum number of the animal is used for the toxicity testing, and there are many different measurements or the, uh, the ways to do it. So the MFDS guideline on the food, particularly for the health function of food, uh, require the LD50 calcul uh, calculation. So here uh, for the pharmaceuticals, single dose toxicity testing calculate ALD, but for food, in line with the OECD guideline, LD50 cutoff value is calculated. So depending on the test system, there are different. For the known rodent, it's not ALD. It, we cannot calculate ALD. So here, the welfare of the animal is more highlighted for the non-rodent. So here, if you review the report or write the report, you need to identify a dose at which toxicity symptoms can be clearly observed. So what kind of the toxicity symptoms are observed at different dose level? That should be stated in the report. Then for the repeated dose toxicity, when it comes to the designing of that testing, um, these are the main points that need to be considered for design. For the administration route, the intended clinical route needs to be considered. It can be oral. So if the product is to be taken oral, then here it needs to be oral. But other routes may be uh, selected if justified on the basis of pharmacological PKPD and also toxicokinetic background. An observation and examination, clinical signs, body weight, food and water consumption, and after, uh, ophthalmological examination, and especially for Beagle, the uh, ECG. The QT intervals, QT intervals are also uh, examined. For clinical pathology, uh, urine, uh, urine analysis, hematological, and clinical biochemistry tests need to be included. And for pathology, we need to look at uh, the necropsy findings and also we'll measure the organ weight and also histopathological examination need to be done on a certain organs. And in addition, TK, the whole body exposure, whether the uh, material can be accumulated or if there is any uh, gender difference or the exposure increases depending on the dose or not in dependent on those. So these kind of the things need to be reviewed. So based on these uh, indexes for the repeated dose toxicity test, we need to calculate the target organ and NOIL. So at what dose this material does not occur the toxicity to the uh, test system. And also we need to consider the target organ. Let's say the acetaminophen's uh, target organ is river. So at the end of the day, the repeat dose toxicity test need to produce NOIL and a target organ. And of course, MTD and NOIL can be also calculated. And by having the NOIL calculation, as you can see here, 
Based on that, phase one, uh, what kind of the dose can be used for the phase one uh, can be decided, including the safety margin. So for the repeated dose toxicity testing, it can be two weeks or four weeks or 13 weeks, or if there can be some chronic toxicity test. ICH-M3R2 or MFDS guidelines say that IND and NDA may be different, but the duration of the clinical trial is identified for the rodent and the non-rodents. So the table is provided like this one. This is for the IND, and the next table is for the NDA for the non-rodents and the rodents maximum duration of clinical trials. So you need to follow these tables in designing the duration of the testing. So I summarize these two tables into one here. For the chemical products, let's say you are developing chemical product before starting phase one, uh, we need to complete four week repeat dose testing. And 13 week repeat dose testing need to be done before phase three uh, completion. So this is the timeline that you can defer to. This is kind of a written. Of course, it may be a little bit different from one material to another. And MFDS may require a little bit different details for different uh, substances or the materials. But as a whole, in general, this is the principle that applies. And for the repeat dose toxicity testing, we need to consider the following points for its design. Let me go one by one. First one is the animal species. Usually, for general toxicity repeat dose testing, rodent and non rodent are used. However, there can be some exceptions, like for the vaccines or for biologics. The species may have some different biological relations, so the biological related species considering the human need to be selected. For the biologics, usually the primates is used, but sometimes rodent and non rodents can be used too. But in deciding animal uh, species to be used, the PK profile of human and the animal's PK profile need to be compared and they need to be comparable. Then only then the data, toxicity data from animal can be extrapolated to the human. So if the uh, PK data from the animal is too different uh, from the, uh, the data from human, we cannot just apply the data to human. So for rodent, rat and mouse are usually used and for the non-rodent, most preferred non-rodent would be the beagle dog. If it is not possible, primate. Or sometimes if it's about the skin-related task, the mini pig is used. But for a mini pig, if it's not possible to uh, use the mini pig, then the beagle dog can be used to conduct uh, the repeat dose testing, the toxicity testing on the skin-related uh, topic. We actually conducted such testing before. For rabbit, usually the vaccine toxicity testing and reproductive and developmental toxicity testing are the one that where the rabbit is used. And also the uh, the treatment group is important. I mean, the number or the size of the treatment group and the sexes of the treatment group can this can impact how we can interpret the data, and then therefore we can have the predictability for the safety in human. It is important to have sufficient data so that we can have meaningful scientific interpretation of the data. So the composition of the treatment group and the, and also let's say the 13 week repeat those testing, then after four weeks, we have the recovery pace. So we, and then after the recovery, the changes that observed, that were observed during the treatment pace, during the recovery phase, 
are they improved or not? And we also have the term called delayed toxicity, meaning that during the treatment phase, there was no signs of the toxicity. However, during the recovery phase, we may have some delayed toxicity. So we do have to have recovery phase, usually uh, longer than four weeks. So as you can see from this table for the rodent and non-rodent, let's say you make a submission to the MFDS for the repeat dose toxicity testing. This may be a good reference. So we have four groups, test article three and control one and 10 uh, per six per group. And for recovery group, it provides only it is provided only for the control and high dose like five per six so for uh, male 10 15 10 10 let's say if you have the toxicokinetic groups for the non uh, for the rodent group there can be some shock during the blood drawing so it may uh, confuse the result so for the non for the rodent we do have the toxicokinetic groups and the same design is applied to this group and then draw the blood at a time point, define the time point for the non-rodent control one group, test article three group and three animals per six per group and for the toxicokinetic groups, we do not have that group for example, for beagle dog uh, a lot of uh, blood is circulated so like 24 hours during the 24 hours every one uh, minute we draw the blood if it's not that kind of a approach then for the non-rodent we have like three animals per sex per group so we do not have to have a separate toxicokinetic group for here, the rodent, you can see like 10 and 5, the size is not that small, but for non-rodent, it's only like 3 or 2, so the number of the animals is not many. And the data show a, some variability between uh, the animal to animal for the non-rodent. So for the non-rodent data, the analysis needs to be a more refined and sophisticated. Next consideration point would be the route of administration. We need to apply the same route as that intended for humans. And if we want to use other routes, then it should be justified on the basis of a scientific uh, information. For example, let's say we have the intended route of administration but, uh, for a mouse that uh, route is too small uh, for the injection so we need to select another route then the pk profile need to be analyzed from the blood and there is no uh, not much of a difference from the human and then let's say if the uh, the route of the administration for oral and for other let's say intraformular if the pk profiles are the same or the similar then we can justify it and i think that uh sub q or uh, the oral and oral would be uh, the most used uh, route of administration but for the non-rodent catheter like the John there can be used for the oral administration but you can see that even the uh, small dogs can uh, take the pills so we can actually make a pill with the solution in it so that to make them uh, take it so excipients can be used so that the uh, test articles can be uh, dissolved with that uh, exp uh, excipient and then John there can be used uh, to administer that to test the article but at the same time because we use the excipients we need to understand how the stability and others for, for non rodents if you use a uh, capsule we do not use the uh, excipients because the capsule itself does not change the formation or the characteristics of the uh, test articles themselves. And other uh, route of administration, these are the types of the routes that uh, my organization uh, test. 
like subcutaneous intraderma, intra uh, carotid artery, and others. And recently, we do have the gene therapy. So for the gene therapy, the route of administration can be very diverse. So for the rodent, uh, we also have to utilize this kind of the procedures to administer like uh, intraventricular and intratechal and others. And another point to consider is the test article and the dose formulation. For oral administration or sub-Q, they can be administered as a solution and suspension. However, for IV, it should be solution because the solution will be circulated into lung. So if there is a particle, then the animal may die. So for IV administration, it should be solution. And here, the test articles need to be in a formation that can be well administered. Sometimes some solutions or the test articles are not well soluble. So let's say sometimes uh, if the test article or the test material need to be administered in large amount, the viscosity can be a very high. If that is the case, the John Day cannot uh, administer that solution very well. So the uh, dissolution is really important. And of course, that need to be the chemically and physically stable. And of course, the dose formulation uh, can be un analyzed. What does that mean is that a single dose or repeat dose toxicity testing, if we uh, want to do it, we usually do the DRF first, the dose range finding study. And when we submit, DRF is actually uh, may not be the uh, mandatory for certain testing. So sometimes for the uh, those formulation, we need to have the validation. So we do the DRF first, and then the validation, and then for go for the repeat dose testing. But as you can see on the uh, picture. A is solution, B is a physically unstable suspension, and C is physically stable suspension. But when we do the DRF, the, the material itself or the solution itself by visual inspection seems to be stable. So let's say we do the four-week DRF toxicity testing. Then based on that, the dose is set for the 13-week repeat dose testing. However, from the dose formulation analysis, the validation shows that this is not stable. Although it seems to be stable with a visual inspection, however, when we do the validation on the dose formation, maybe it's not stable. And for the natural uh, extract or the herbal uh, extract, um, maybe the content would be very different from the one on the COA. So it's important to do the uh, analysis of the dose formulation as soon as possible. And the DRF need to be done as kind of a pre uh, preliminary testing. If uh, the stability is not obtained, then the excipients need to be changed. And if the excipient is changed, then the conditions affecting the toxicity is also different. And then we need to conduct the DRF again. And if we have to do this, then we need to have have a enough timeline. So this is why dose formulation analysis is important. The next point to consider is dose volume. We cannot just administer a different dose into different animals randomly. So from many different references, we can find out some like maximum dose as volumes. So SOPs actually have this kind of information. So you, based on this reference, you can set the, uh, the dose volume. But the point is that this is recommended dose volume. But my product under development may require a uh, larger dose. Sometimes the concentration is too high and therefore uh, there is a viscosity. So 
we need to increase the dose volume. So your uh, intended dose volume may be higher than this uh, recommended dose volume. Then you can just at least try with animal. So you can see whether there is a suffering from the animal side or if there is any other change. So if there is no change observed, so if that is the case, you can uh, up, uh, increase a little bit of the dose volume from this recommended level. And the most important point in the designing is the dose levels. The DRF or short-term GLP toxicity study need to be conducted in order to set the dose level. ICHM3R2, the, the, these are from taken from that. So usually the high dose is important. So the toxicity is observed at the high dose and at a low dose, non-toxic dose is observed. That's the ideal situation. But when we do the toxicity testing in reality, sometimes the test articles do not have the toxicity, so we just cannot have the kind of a dose. So basically, these are the principles how we can set the high dose for the high dose MFD or the maximum feasible dose is important. For example, we talked about like 20 uh, liter per cage, 5,000 mg per cage. That's the maximum. Then MFD would be uh, 5,000. But for the cell therapy, let's say the 0.2 ml per head. And the maximum cell in that is also defined. If the cell size is small, then of course the cell number will be increased. But MSC, the cell size is large, so the cell number can be limited. So MFD need to be considered in setting the high dose. And also there is MTD. For the MTD, it does not cause the death of the animal and not the serious but moderate toxicity. So uh, like ten, within 10% of the differences compared to the control. So that would be the MTD. And if it's not possible to set the MTD in the DRF, then we can consider limit those. 1000 MPK. For herbal MP, uh, medicine, 2000 MPK. Health function of food. 5,000 or even 10,000. But usually for the health function of food, the MFD is applied. And exposure saturation. Exposure saturation is, let's say we do the TK testing. The TK profile and the AUC is compared. Let's say we have like ton, uh, 1,500 PK, MPK, and they look at the uh, profile. You can see AUC at 500, 1,000, and 2,000. So we can see the similar AUC at 1,000 and 2,000. So the exposures are similar. So similar is the exposure is already, the exposure is already enough at the 1,000 level. And therefore, 2,000 level exposure is not necessary. So exposure saturation of such need to be considered. And for the AUC, uh, mean exposure margin 50 times higher than and the clinical, now uh, that is for the high dose, M3R2 specify this. So well-designed study include a dose at which the toxicity is observed. And based on that, uh, the high dose is set first, and then the low dose group and the middle dose group can be set. When setting the uh, low dose group, of course, we will have the clinical trial uh, dose, planned one, we need to consider the body, the surface area, and then convert the animal dose to the human dose. But if it's lower than or smaller than the clinical trial dose, and and if the low dose group is at that point, at that level, then it's no use uh, to do this toxicity. So we need to always consider the clinical trial dose when we decide the low dose group. For low dose, Noel or Noel, middle dose, geometric mean, 
let's say low 250, middle 500, 2.5 uh, difference. So the appropriate interval of those, uh, the appropriate common ratio need to be considered. So oral needs to be higher than the non-oral and low solubility is higher than the high solubility like that. So when we do the oral toxicity study, the common ratio would be like 3 or 2. But the RF study, we usually apply 2.5 or 3 and the repeat dose 3 common ratio. But for the IV administration, usually the common ratio is two. So now we have data from the from the testing. Then the PI or the analyst need to do the analysis. Only then we can understand whether it's uh, toxicologically significant change or not. And there are things to be considered in the analysis. First of all, we need to make sure in the design that the doses at which toxicity is observed should include included. Let's say we can observe the toxicity. However, if the dose level is not sufficient to observe the toxicity, then there is no use. And actually, there was a cases where the submission was made to the MFDS, but the reviewers say that your study does not include the dose at where the toxicity can be observed, so you need to do it again. So, for the, especially for the high dose, usually the toxicity is observed. So, we just cannot say that we have like 100 uh, times higher NOIL, uh, compared to uh, what is required, uh, and therefore we are fine. But uh, that's not always the approach that we can take. And there are pharmacological actions of the product. So we need to uh, think about the fact that the excessive pharmacological action is actually toxicity. It is considered as toxicity. And the recovery during the recovery uh, group or the recovering period uh, does not mean that it is not a toxicity. Let's say there is a significant toxicological response, but during the recovery phase, uh, the recovery group recovered. And therefore, it is not toxicologically significant. But this is not always true. If even if there is a uh, if if there is no toxicologically significant changes or the symptoms during the recovery group, uh, if it uh, lender too much pain on the animals, that is also considered toxicologically significant, and the attention need to be paid to the body weight in the DRF test, so that we can observe at what those level the toxicity is clearly presented. So the kind of the things need to be considered in designing repeat dose testing. And we do the DRF testing to set the dose range. ALP sometimes can be like three times higher than 100 is normal, then 300 is what we see. So we can say that this affects the liver significantly. So including that dose, we do the repeat dose testing. However, the number is high, but we do not see the uh, the changes a lot. And of course, the histo uh, histopathological examination does not show a very much uh, differences. So simply put, the result from the DRF study is not always 100% repeated in the repeat dose testing. And the clinical trial dose and the MFD need to be considered in designing the study. So as I mentioned before, MRSD, in setting the early dose for the early uh, clinical trial, the body surface area need to be converted to the human equivalent dose. And this is for the oral administration, but basically it's not just for the oral, but also for IV. Here, you can see this part, for example, red. 
let's say Noel Noel is here. So here you can see we have 620 and it is divided by 6.2 and we have the safety factor. So safety factor 10 is also applied. Then we can have the calculated number for the clinical dose. So we need to consider this kind of a dose, high dose, medium, and low dose. We do have them, and the NOI is set at the uh, low dose. Then we need to calculate this one, and if it is lower than the clinical dose, then we need to think about the common ratio, whether the common ratio is appropriate to be applied or not. So this is the table that you can refer to. And at the same time, for example, here, DOG, 1.8, a red, 6.2. So usually we go for the rodent test first. So DRF is done, and then the rodent testing is done. So for the beagle dogs, of course, the animals itself is uh, expensive, and you know that we do not we are, we try not to have the death of the animals. So considering the surface body body surface area is a three times difference. So if we have like 2,000 MPK and there was no significant toxicity observed, and then 600 or 700 can be set for the uh, beagle dog. So that's how we do the uh, MDRF. So it's not just an explora uh, exploration or the uh, it's done to the human body. And another thing that we need to consider is that um, anatomical the anatomy of the human body and of the animals are different. For rat, the stomach, you can see uh, here non-gladular and the gladular stomach, but human has only gladular stomach. And we do have the changes in the non-gladular stomach in rodent. But when we extrapolate to the human, but the human body has does not have the non-glanular stomach. So if you look at the report for this study, the NOIL at this study is this one. However, because of the uh, the anatomical difference between the human and the rodent, uh, this cannot be extrapolated to the human body. So in analyzing data and making the exploration to the human body, these kind of the things need to be considered. Um, OECD TG452 is about chronic toxicity studies. ICH guideline does not provide a much detail about the chronic toxicity. So I will just go over very briefly on this. So you can see here that unlike the OECD, when we do the chronic toxicity study, there is an interim kill group and others, but for the pharmaceutical chronic toxicity study, we do not have the interim kill. And there is also at least the seven days of the acclimation for the rodent. And um, dosing of the animal should begin preferably before the animals are eight weeks old. So these type of things may be different because for the acclimation, we apply like uh, different days because we are based on the OECD TG409. So let's say uh, the test material with the test article has some issue. So dosing can be like two weeks delayed or three weeks postponed. This kind of the things need to be considered. It's not just about the testing schedule, but at the same time, whether uh, the animals are eight weeks, eight weeks old or not, that kind of the things also considered. And as for the number of animals, you can you can read the slide. And clinical signs, general clinical signs, but also detailed clinical signs need to be looked up like first week and at the end of the first week and monthly. And also the functional observations, including sensory activity, grip strength, and the motor activities need to be done for the rodent, ophthalmological examination, body weight, these are very similar to the general toxicity study. However, in terms of uh, the frequency of the body weight and the number of the animals, they are specified. 
However, we, we just do not simply follow OECD TG4052. Rather, we refer to the MFDS guideline and also the OECD TG409, which is on the chemical, but we can also refer to this kind of other document or the guideline. We're in on analysis hematology, clinical biochemistry here. The infant kill is specified in this guideline, like three and six and 12 months. But when we have the chronic toxicity study for the rodent, well, when we do the sacrifice, the blood testing and the blood analysis is done at the necropsy. The same is true for the urine analysis for the, for the non-rodent group. The blood can be withdrawn. So before the demonstration, the urine analysis and hematologic analysis are done. And then uh, 13 weeks after the uh, administration, we can have the uh, data. And then at the end of the study at 39, we can also have the data from the blood and also the urine. So for the chronic toxicity study, as I said before, the target organ and also no oil need to be calculated. So I briefly went over the general toxicity study for non rodent and rodent, and the focus was on the repeat dose testing. I also covered ICH uh, guideline as four. So you need to consider these uh, points that I shared during the presentation uh, in designing your study or in commissioning the, the study to the test organization. Thank you very much for your attention.